sang um, and she, she sang well but she was never one to get a chance to record or anything like that and my father uh, used to play guitar which I only found out later in my life I wondered where did I want this passion or where did I get this passion from to want to play the guitar and I found out that my father used to play so I have his guitar now and um, you know it's strange but you know, when you look back, you realize that you have the genes, the singing genes from my mother and father, and the, and the musical side of playing an instrument from my father. Dr. Anthony Carter, better known as the Mighty Gabby, can be considered Barbados's most prolific songwriter, having written over 1,300 songs. In this presentation, he shares his passion for music, connections to his culture, and his love for children. Well, there wasn't anyone around um, to work with me because remember Calypso and folk wasn't um, considered as priorities because our education uh, system was structured to look at, at the arts as being secondary. Um, I'm not, I don't even sure if she says secondary as being uh, uh, almost a non-entity as being something that the most you could refer to it as would be a hobby and not as a, 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 a vocation or some kind of career or something like that. It was not, not that. So there was no one for me to work with when I was that age. Well, I was exposed to most other genres of music at that time. Jazz, blues, uh, rock, um, soul, uh, R&B when it first came out. So I was able to listen to those singers and, and musicians, mostly out of the United States. And also, um, Red Fusion it was Red Fusion, and it was like, Bob, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Strauss, etc., etc. You know, so you were able to hear different kinds of music. And of course, the diet on Thursdays, I think it was, with Sparrow, Kitchener, Lion, Attila, you know, Spoiler, and so on. And that's the one that grabbed me most. I, I thought they were so creative. I used to be wondering, how did they get to write a song about that? What made them so good to be able to sing about just about anything, about a woman, about a tree, about a river, you know, about carnival, about food, uh, uh, about work, about soldiers. About, they, 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 had, they had touched on every subject. So that is the one that I tend to want to um, fear towards, you know, so I guess I, I had Eucalypso bug since I was about six, seven years old. The mighty Gabby, who formed the Battleground Calypso tent in the 1970s, has dominated the Calypso stage, having won nine Calypso titles and two of the crop twice. He's also been the youngest Calypso monarch in Barbados, winning with the songs Heart Transplant and Family Planning in 1968 at the age of 19. Oh, 
I felt in awe of the people whom I competed against when I was a teenager. You're talking about Sedan, a real king. Um, Sivers, Charmer, Sugar. You know, I, these guys could sing Calypso. And, um, you know, I was just grateful to be even in the room with the rehearsal, never mind anything else. And then, you know, when I began to sing, I realized that someone was actually paying attention to what I was singing. And at that time, too, one of our best singers of Calypso was Jack Yofel, even though he wasn't known for it, um, because he could sing the other kinds of, the other genres of music so well. But Jack used to actually write Calypso's and sing them. And I mean, sing them, because he could phrase and had color and excitement in his voice, you know, and, and range, and anything you could think of as a singer Jack Yopel had, right? He had that presence that, that you couldn't, you know, ignore at, at all, you know? So um, I would say that those are the ones that I kind of like emulated. I was glad to be amongst them. And um, in this time now switched around. Um, I don't know if there's anybody at all what I do, but um, the, the truth is that I am grateful to be with them. So that I had Vlad around me since he was 13, 14 years old. A classic when he was a teenager, um, you know, around me. Shawnee when he was a teenager. So there's so many of them that we had, that I personally had around me as teenagers or very, very early in their 20s. And, you know, someone like Alison Hines, the poor with her when she was a teenager. That, that to me was a privilege, it was an honor, and it was fun. Uh, with the whole Square One band, and of course, amongst them, George Jones, the leader of the band. You know, he and I became attached because he was my son, so I look at George uh, like a son. Square One was playing at Pier 29, and Gabby and Greiner were about to embark on a European tour, which was organized by Eddie Grant. And these guys were looking for a band to come with them. And they came in Pier 29, and people were moving to a new back and watched our performance. And during intermission, you know, they came backstage and laid out the plan. You know, they were very impressed with what they saw. And they made us an offer that was too good to refuse. They actually offered to take us on a European tour. And at that point in time, we were so excited, you know, we were not even interested in payment or anything we saw. The experience in itself of going on tour with Gabby and Reina and the list of countries that they outlined was, was, you know, enough to, to secure our, our, our interests. Then after that, we went on a tourism tour to Canada, and a few cities in Canada. And I ended up being Gabby's roommate. And you know, I was like, at first I was kind of intimidated because it was like, here I am with this great Barbie icon. You know, I was just average George, and I ended up being his roommate, and he had no objections. And we, you know, we were able to, to share a lot of, of, of our backgrounds and lives and stuff like that. And, and we became very, very close from there. I remember in 1991, we appeared as the back and bar for Gabby at the Stockholm World Festival, uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Gabby was the headliner, one of the headliners, uh, Gabby and Greg. And we were just an unknown back and bar. And Gabby thought that since we were a bar on our own, we should have at least 15 minutes out of his 45 minute set. So he gave us the first 15 minutes out of his set to just go there and showcase our talent as the band's program. So that in itself is, is a success story. And that was largely due in part to the fact that the mighty Gabby, Eddie Grant, and Ren, they gave us an opportunity to, to be exposed to that, you know, to that type of uh, audience, to that type of uh, Surroundings, as you know, um, the stadium has never seen the kind of support and the kind of division and mass hysteria as a Gabby Red class in my class. No, you never, you never. Yes. 
There's the, the rivalry between Gabby and Red Plastic Bike. I come from St. Philip. You know, we were always Plastic Bike fans. But when they, when they, um, when they met Gabby, uh, you know, all of that kind of changed because the, the, the rivalry that was created was created amongst the fans and not between the two artists themselves. As a matter of fact, the two artists are, are the best friends. So comfortable was the mighty Gabby on stage, he played the lead role in the stage production Under the Duppy Parasol, written and directed by Paul Webster in New York City. This guy Jerry from Trinidad, he said he could not make it. So Paul asked me if I would read the script in the guy's absence, and I did. And when I read it, he said, Gabby, read it again. I read it. He said, man. Would you take this part? I'm going to talk to Jerry because you're putting more feeling into it than Jerry. You, 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 you got the character that I was looking for all the time. How you do that? I said, well, this character sounds like my grandfather. And I can emulate my grandfather. I can mimic my grandfather. I can actually stand here and see him. And that's how I got the part. And Jerry was relieved. Jerry said, oh my God, I got my exams. I was so happy that you know, somebody else came. And so he wasn't annoyed that I got the part at all. As a matter of fact, he would come to whatever rehearsals he could come. And uh, you know, he was very helpful to me too. And that's how I got involved in the play, both as an actor and as a, and as a singer and songwriter. New York is special to me, you know. Um, I was just honored by the New York State Assembly. I've already been honored by the New York, uh, also by New York City Council this time, but the, the, um, the Boston and, and so that area. Um, I have a lot of connection to it. And I am always glad to have the opportunity to spread Barbados's name wherever I go, but there is a certain affinity, a certain connectivity to New York that has been like that for me since May um, 1971. I return here on the 10th of uh, August, I'm sorry, on the 12th of August 1976, but I had left on the 10th of May 1971. So it was five clear years that I had not seen Barbados. You know, to, to see Barbados again, it was like joy. It was real joy. I, and it still happens today. I, I just went away for two weeks and I'm there on the plane. I counted every minute by the minute for the last 45 minutes of that flight. I looked at the thing on the screen uh, where they show movies and all that. And I went only to the map and watched every moment on fall until we landed. It just like the anxiety of, of being home. I wanted to be with the children. And I knew I had a rehearsal the next, um, the same day that I came in with the children. And they told me, then they called and said, no, Gabby, oh gosh, no, don't worry, come tomorrow. So I came, I went the following day. And um, 
you know, I was just happy to be there with them. And I had written five of the ten songs that were performed at St. Paul's graduation um, just um, a few days ago. So, you know, I, what can I say? I just love being with the St. Paul's children. And a lot of them did extremely well in the exams. And you know, our parents were worried and they said, oh, I don't want my child to be singing, you know, we've got the 11 plus coming up and blah, blah, blah. But I want you to know that a whole lot of them passed for Harrison Scholars and Combermere and Queen Scholars and, and um, St. Michael's and all the other schools that are recognized as being prestigious in this country. And uh, all of them did extremely well, both in English and mathematics. So it, it totally destroyed the myth that when children take part in other activities that it hinders them from um, excelling in, in, in academics. That's nonsense. So, okay, these are the harmonies and these are the ones that sing in phonics. And none is better than the other. For me, discipline is key. For Gabby, discipline is key. So I get to realize those students who need a stronger discipline code than others. And then there's some who will be natural. So for me, it gives me homework. I have to go after each class, we have to do an evaluation. We have to make sure that these children are comfortable. Not every child will embrace what we're doing at the beginning, but surely by the end of the program, we have 100% or very close to that participation and children who want to continue the program. I was never one for beating or things like that, so it's like I try to find a way um, to get instill in children so that they can learn without having to even think that there's some kind of um, capital punishment going on or about to happen if this thing don't happen the way that, that they have been instructed to do. Gabby sees children as children and he helps them to self-actualize. Um, in the performing arts, children that ordinarily would not be visible in the class you get to see them shining and as St. Paul stars, and they get to see how they can um, actually learn and feel that, hey, I can do this. I am proud to do this. Gabby is so individualistic with children so that he can pull out of them the strong points that they have, and they respect him tremendously. The biggest part about it is being disciplined. When we go out, we cannot be playing the fool or anything. And we really appreciate Gabby's help by taking off his time, even when he has something to do. And he does not expect anything in return. We are very grateful for that. Basically, there's harmony and tonic, but we can do different kinds of, kinds of singing, like staccato. My favorite part in this performing arts group is that we have fun and we entertain people and be on the top of everything mostly. And my other favorite part is being a harmony. We prepare for it by, tra by training very hard. Miss Booster does that very well and also um, Uncle Gabby. Among this maestro's achievements are the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation's award for best song written by a Barbadian for the song Emerton, an honorary doctorate from the University of the West Indies in 2012, and the Clement Payne Hero Award in 2005. He's also been honored as far away as Nigeria, where he has been named Chief Omawali, meaning our son has returned. You tell me to forget that my grandmother was born right there so all right I say I shall go you tell me to forget it is there I want my own children to grow all right I say I shall go if you remember the TV images of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even the early 2000s, 
They always portrayed Africa someplace so backward and all the children with big pot bellies, you know. They never portrayed Africa as a place that have cities big like New York City or, or Toronto or Montreal or, or London or something like that. So Caribbean people never saw African people as being progressive people. We all saw them as people looking for a hand out on a bag and, you know, oh my God, the children can soon die. But nobody explained that in the vast majority of those countries or in those areas, um, that it, the reason why the children were starving is because they had no rainfall. Sometimes the rain and fall for five years, six years, seven years. Well, all of them shows on TV, you must agree, are not for me. Show me some castle in my skin. Why, George Lummy, for my viewing. When I read George's book, I didn't read it from the perspective of this great writer that writes in this thing. I'm reading it from the perspective of, here's my friend who has the ability to write at this level. And I want to honor him in song, but in a very concise manner so that I don't have to label, uh, uh, label the song with heavy lyrics and heavy melodic structure and chord structure and all of that. I go for the other way, the simplicity, the kiss uh, system. Keep it simple, stupid, right? And once I have that, the children love simplicity. But at the same time, they're getting a very complicated story and a very deep story being said in a few words. Like Emerton, you tell me to forget that my grandmother was born right here, so all right, I say I shall go. I chose the song Flood Waters because it tells us about George Lamey when he was growing up and the terrible things he went through, but he still achieved a lot of goodness so that we can do great things and that we can do anything that we want to do once we put our minds to it. The Mighty Gabby continues to perform and write music for many others, professionals and amateurs alike. You have something called economy of words. So if you use the economy of words, you know, instead of giving some elongated statement, uh, which I call like letters to the editor, you just forget the letters to the editor of the newspaper or the magazine, and you're writing a song and you want it to have impact, not only with those that are singing it, but with those that are listening to it or hearing it for the first time. You don't have to listen a thousand times for it to have an effect on them. So when I pick up my guitar, I'm not saying that this particular chord we go here and I get too complicated. Take it and from your heart play. My friend got two women. Johnny got two wishes. You know that is proud. But what really, really caused his strife? He love his girlfriend better than his wife. Every time the two of them meet, it is back and down in the street. They can't sing it. Can't happen with me. None is on fence with me. I don't care how you write, Christine. You got to share your husband with me. You can't have fence with me. And some of my best songs, or best known songs, are songs that happen in less than half hour. Jack, Bowes, Hit It, Emerton, Bridgestone, Who Killed Pele, uh, you know, Gimme Soka. You know, take down Nelson, um, Waki Waki. It, these are songs that come with passion. And if the passion comes, and, and that urgency to get it out there, the urgency to look, this got to happen, and now, whoop, 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 whoop. that's it. 
you know, and think about it. At some time after, I remember I did a program once on uh, uh, Vice of Barbados. Yeah. And, um, and Mark Fingal challenged me. He said, I heard you say write songs in 10 minutes and 15 minutes. OK, I'm going to the bathroom. By the time I come back, let me see how far you get with a song. And I said, OK, ready? He said, no, no, no. I give you the subject, or that might have been something you had written before or something. So right on to this thing. I said, OK. Came back. I said, here. So you get through any lines? I said, I finished the song. He goes, oh. Singing the melody. The lyrics look good. The lyric. Matt goes on the air, he says, um, until somebody from China or Russia or England or some other country comes up with a song in less than three minutes, I declare Gabby the fastest songwriter in the world. The mighty Gabby wants to be remembered as someone who loves all kinds of music, cares for people, and loves children. He is especially close to his children. Quite naturally, I inherited Dad's artistic genes. I've always considered myself a child of the arts. I grew up performing in plays, dance recitals, sang in both my church and school's choirs, and was always drawing and sketching, always loved the arts. Um, when I decided to get into the interior design field, I was about age 16, and Dad's advice to me was simply this. Do what you love, do what makes your heart sing, do what you're passionate about. Because at the end of the day, no matter what you do for a living, you have to be happy. It thrills me to see dad at this age working with children. He's always said that if he were not a singer, actor, performer, that he would be a teacher. And so to see him working with the children from St. Paul's Primary School, in rhythms calling the choir, it really warms my heart. And what is Gabby's hope for this generation? It would be the Performing Arts Center, for, without doubt. And I do not mean a, a, a period art center where they could go and draw, where they could go and, and learn to play a guitar or piano, or you know, where they could go and learn to dance, um, where they could learn about artists before them, have an archive and have a place where they can see the artists and what they have contributed, uh, where they could meet with the Omawali Stuart or meet with uh, any of the artists because this is important to children. They would love that. Where they could meet Sigari, where they could meet Desmond Haynes and, and, and Joel Garner and, 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 and and, and Gordon Greenwich, uh, 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 you know, my great friends, uh, uh, Charlie Griffith. This is what we are lacking in Barbados. We just need to have a place, a, 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 continu a continuum, where our people meet. And then, of course, the tourists themselves will be happy to meet our icons like that. And it will help tourism, it will help the arts, it will help the economy, and it will help us to grow as a nation. Join us next time for another edition of We Beiges, presented by the Barbados Government Shayla. Information Service. I'm Sheila Murrow. Yeah, Thanks no for other. watching. Sheila, Sheila, there is no other. Darling, you're doing your best for the GIS. You're breaking no rule by coming here to St. Paul's School with the children. Singing for you and Gabby playing for you, and your guarantee, Miss Sheila, everything going on the camera. 